and we're live. It is five minutes before the hour, before seven o'clock. Hopefully you guys are, had, had a good weekend, which I did. It was awesome. I got to spend a bit of time down West Tech doing lots and lots of testing. So, you know, hardly the only thing better than spending time down there and getting all of this pages and pages worth of data on the supercharged 3800 V6 is coming home <laughs> to see my wife and my family and my dogs, my two golden retrievers. As much as I love going down there testing, I love getting back and seeing the family even more. Family's number one. But I was able to get a lot of testing done. Unfortunately, I, thought, I was hoping to get the 5.9 liter, the 360 Dodge also done. I was kind of thinking about bringing that back and doing the disassembly and the reassembly here, but I wasn't able to do that. But I did get a lot of the 3800 stuff done, and I'm really excited about the fact that um, Tyler's in the house. <laughs> Shout out to Tyler. That's the first one I see there with a comment. Um, I'm, I'm excited that the 3800, first of all, just even before getting any of the data or, or any of that, just having it go together and having it work. Because I had a little bit of a scare when I put that thing together. I mean, the what I did was, and you saw the videos that I did previously on getting both of the motors ready. So I took the cylinder heads off that we had previously the guys from LNR had redone on the L32 motor. And so we know that the heads were good on that. And but unfortunately, we hurt bearings in that. So that was no good. We couldn't run that anymore. And the L67 that we originally tried to run and, and the one that we used to get everything going with the fuel injection and whoever helped us out again, I'll try to say this every time, whoever helped us out with getting the fuel injection actually working, Ish and Eric were able to take the information that he supplied and get the... Um, the thing so it recognize get the holly hp so it recognizes the signal so we could then i could then go in and tune it very easily once i had the hp running on this thing so we were able to get both the l67 and the l32 up and running and, and not have any problems um and so i was very excited about getting it all working and doing all the testing which i got a lot done but as i said before that happened we had a scare and that was the fact that this thing had no oil pressure <laughs> so i put it I put it all together. I put the L32 heads on the L67 and made this little hybrid kind of thing. Although I don't think that there's a really big difference between the cylinder heads, not judging by the flow testing that I did. Um, but we got that all together and I put it up on the dyno. And the first thing I did, but even before I hooked up water or the fuel injection or any of that stuff, what I did was put a new filter on it, <laughs> drain the oil. I didn't reuse the oil from the, from the wrecking yard. Um, I may or may not have done that with the L32 in the past, which is maybe why it's not working anymore. But we put fresh oil in it, put, put a fresh filter on it. And then what we do is with the plugs out and we can spin it over with the dyno and then it spins a little faster and then the pump picks up. And I thought, well, you know, usually these motors have already been running or were run in the past. And so they're, the oil pump is usually stays primed and stuff. But just in case, what, what, what we do and the thing that we do with new motors, like if we run a motor that's freshly built and, and it's an LS or something that has a gyro rotor pump like that uh, driven off of the crank like that, we will seal everything up and then I will pressurize the um, crankcase with an air nozzle. And once we see a pound and a half, maybe two pounds of pressure in the system, that helps push the oil up, basically pressurizing it, <laughs> pushes it up into the, um, uh, into the pickup and into the into the pump and then when we crank it over we're using the starter with no plugs in it it grabs the oil quicker and then we see oil immediately in the pressure because when i did that i also have the line hooked up from a pressure tap from the oil pressure tap up to the dyno and the dyno tells me we have both a uh, a mechanical gauge you know just a gauge and then also the, the pressure sensor for the dyno that reads it digitally so that we can data log it and we look at both of those and try to crank the thing over. And when I did that, there was no oil pressure. Oh, great. Because <laughs> I had never taken the bottom end part of the L67 apart because we knew it didn't have good heads on it. So we knew we had to fix that. So in doing that, I thought, okay, well, it's probably going to be good. You know, fingers crossed. We want it to be good. So therefore, it should be good. And as we know, that always works out. So I took the pan down, took the pickup off, took the front cover off, took the oil pump out, and basically just played with it. Um, I poured more oil in the pump and spun it around and, and it seemed like it had oil in there anyway already. Um, took the took the filter off or took the the um, pickup off and looked at the screen and there was nothing in there. Maybe a few bits of, of silicone or something in there. 
you know, because it is a wrecking yard motor and it's all greasy and grimy and has dirt all over it and stuff. Um, but we did that. And I basically just put it back together. And then when we did, <laughs> did the same procedure again, and then this time it had oil pressure. So I thought, oh, okay, good. Now it has lots of oil pressure. It, had, it was showing over 70 pounds, 72 or 73 pounds um, on the starter motor, which is a good, a good amount. Normally we're happy if we see 40 or 45 on an LS and that, that means it's a good motor and it's going to run well. So once I got oil pressure that I could put it all the rest, all the way, you know, together with the hook up the, the, um, fuel rails and fuel line and haul the ECU and all that stuff, hook up, put the headers on, do all that stuff and get it ready and start it up. And luckily we already had a, you know, we already had files to start with. I had a, a an, a, or not an NA, but I had a, um, uh, we had a pump gas file because we'd run the L32 previously on pump gas when we started out. Good start, good starting point. Had an E85. I even had the compound boost one that we ran when we were running crazy boost on it. Um, so we had, you know, it was fairly easy to get the thing started and running once we knew that we had oil pressure. And I started out with pump gas, as you saw. If you guys haven't taken a look at the video, please do. You don't have to go look at it right now, or if you could do a split screen and you're clever like that, and much more than I am. Um, you can watch that, but basically the video is, uh, we ran the thing to start out with. I ran it supercharged the way, basically the way that we got it after we put it back together. It's an L67 with the stock early blower with a 3.8 inch pulley with the stock intake manifold and the L32 heads, but then the whole bottom end is L67 stuff. I just put a, a replacement Felpro gasket on it, reuse the stock head bolts. Um, we put bigger injectors in it because we're going to be running, uh, you know, we were going to be running the boost up and stuff and we needed bigger, obviously bigger than stock injectors. I'm, it, I'm a little confused <laughs> um, and surprised that I get that question an awful lot for any of the engine combinations. We can run uh, cylinder heads and camshaft turbos, all kinds of stuff. And they're like, yeah, but did you do this with stock injectors? <laughs> no, we didn't. The stock injectors on all these stock motors are only sized to flow a certain amount of fuel. And no matter how much you want them to flow more, they don't flow enough to support a blower or a turbo or even heads and cam and intake in a lot of cases. If you go from the, the maximize the stock flow rate, it just won't support that power level. So we always put big enough injectors in and we did that in this case and started out by running 91 octane. What I wanted to show to start off with in the video is that we ran on 91 octane and we started out with a low timing level. In this case, it was 16 degrees. Again, remember a lot of the, I got a lot of comments from people saying, well, you can't run that much timing on the street. And I'm like, yeah, you might not be able to, but this is to show you what happens when you run different timing levels and how much power loss is associated with each kind of drop in, in, in timing. Now, maybe I could have gone down below 16. We could have gone down to, you know, 10 or 12 or whatever is a more realistic amount. Um, but we didn't. <laughs> so we ran and, and we're running it fairly cold. We, we have good air, obviously, going in the dinosaur under, under hood and all. So it's a much more optimized kind of combination. We did have all the accessories on it. We were running all of those because we, we used them to run the water pump. I had the I had the tubular headers on there, not the stock exhaust manifolds, in my opinion, it, at least in the testing that I've done. It showed no power, it's certainly not at this power level, at the stock kind of power level. And we ran this motor uh, with the 16, 18, and 20 degrees of timing, eventually uh, moved the timing up to as high as 20 degrees on the on pump gas on 91. And then stepped up to E85 with no timing change, just to show what the E85 did. And then stepped up more in timing because the E85 obviously would allow us to go to even more timing. And I think that the gain between E85 and, and uh, 91 actually with the motor in the car on the street would be even greater because the 85 would allow us to get to kind of where we are in our optimized trim, but the 91 wouldn't be anywhere near that. So I think the timing levels would actually be much lower on the 91 compared to the 85. And this is one application on a supercharged deal, on a root supercharged combination with no intercooler of any kind uh, that really needs, <laughs> really could benefit from E85. It can also benefit from an air to water intercooler, which they offer for this combination, but we did not test one. So we ran it in that trim and tested pump gas, tested the E85, again, all at the stock boost level. Then what I did was, and then you'll see this in the video, 
is I wanted to run this motor NA because before I run anything under boost, I want to know what the NA power output is because then that gives me an idea on what the blower does. And I want to talk about that tonight. And I should have listed that maybe on the <laughs> on the thumbnail. But we ran the thing NA and I ran it with the we we did what everybody does and, and took the rotor pack out of the blower housing and the blower housing still attached to the factory throttle body mass air meter on the on the series two deal. And then I just made a simple cover plate and bolted that on. <laughs> forgot to tighten most of those, uh, but it still worked. Luckily for me that the vacuum holds it shut during idle and then a wide open throttle, you know, they were finger tight enough to where, you know, it didn't really leak. So I ran the thing NA using that upper intake manifold as you will. And then the factory lower in intake manifold that the blower blows into. And I did a kind of a cool test. Um, I ran that thing. We ran the thing NA. And then I, what I did was because the bypass valve closes during wide open throttle during zero vacuum, basically, it's closed while we're making these NA runs. But what I did was wire it open during one of the during a couple of the runs because we we did a little bit of tuning on it to make sure that it, it had the right air fuel and it actually added power. Now it didn't add a ton, but it did add enough that would tell me that this thing wants more airflow. And so what, what you should do and what guys probably do, and I haven't researched this, I haven't gone in and asked some of these guys that are actually using these things on the NA deals, is what you would want to do and what this thing seems to indicate is you would want to hog out the area, the discharge area where the, where the boost blows out. If you, I don't know why you would care about, you know, ruining a, a, a blower housing because you could go find the, you can go find 10 of these at the wrecking yard almost any day of the week. So they're fairly inexpensive. And, and reasonably so. Uh, we may find out, and it'll be an interesting test when I do the back-to-back -back comparisons of the other, of the NA intake manifolds. And yes, we know that the injector positions are different, but all, all we're going to do is plug the holes. So that will be very easy. Um, and especially NA, all I have to do is stick injectors in there and, and they will seal the hole. And that's all they're trying to do. Under boost, we'll have to push them in and hold them down. But on an NA deal, all I have to do is just stick injectors in there. I don't even have to bolt down another rail because there, there won't be room to bolt down two rails. But I'm going to make it so that there'll be two rails when we do it boosted if I end up using one of the NA intake manifolds. But it'll be interesting to see how the long runner NA intake manifolds, both the aluminum one on the, uh, on the Series 3 motor and the composite one on the Series 2 motor, how those two compare. Now, I'd really like to get my hands on one of the the F-body Camaro ones, and the the other ideal choice would be to get the one from Australia. That would be cool. The thing is, I don't know how prevalent that is in the United States. I don't know if guys go to the trouble of getting that manifold and running it on their NA deals if they would if they would go to that extent. It would be interesting kind of to test it to tell them whether or not that's even worthwhile. I mean, if it adds 20 horsepower NA, then I'd say, you know, I think I would go to the trouble of getting the best manifold for that if it's five or 10, I, I might not, you know, go, <laughs> go have something sent over and pay the shipment for, from Australia when, especially on a turbo application, that's just another pound of boost or whatever. And speaking of pound of boost, I like, I like the bypass valve test on this, but speaking of boost, um, one of the things that was interesting is when allowing a running at NA allowed me to compare, to demonstrate how much power that M90 supercharger adds with the factory pulley. So <laughs> for you mathematicians out there, um, we made a 215 horsepower with the uh, NA with the bypass valve open. We made with, and that was run on E85. I just kept the E85 in there rather than switch it around on the NA deal too. We were running the supercharged stuff first and then did the NA testing before we eventually stepped up to a different blower. We put a Gen 5 blower on there and then a different pulley and stuff. And so I ran it at NA and it made 215 horsepower and it made 295 with the, the M90 supercharger and the 3.8 inch pulley also run at E85 in an optimized condition of 21 or 22 degrees of timing is what it ran there. And it ran 27 or 28 is kind of what, where it wanted to be NA it seemed like. So we had a gain of about 80 horsepower. The interesting thing is that um, this thing was running over eight pounds of boost, 8.2 or 8.3 8 or so, 8.4 pounds of boost is what we were seeing 
as a peak at 6,000 RPM. It would actually keep going up if we went beyond that, but peak power occurred before 6,000 RPM. And so we are seeing a gain of around 80 horsepower at about eight pounds. Um, in fact, now that I say that, I would kind of like to go back and look and see where peak power actually occurred because the, the boost might be a little bit lower where peak power occurred because that might be closer to 55 or 5,600. But at any rate, let's say between seven and a half and eight pounds. Um, and so we're, <laughs> if we're only getting 80 horsepower at eight pounds, that's pretty easy math. We're only getting 10 horsepower per pound. The problem is that if we take a look at that NA number, if we take it 215 horsepower or so, or even 212 without the bypass valve deal, that's that's um, you know around four between 14 and 14 and a half horsepower per pound of boost is what the what the blower should be supplying. If we go by the formula, you know the the patented Holdener power boost formula that tells us, and all you have to do is divide the NA number by 14.7 because that's one atmosphere that tells you how much each one of those pounds of boost is worth in terms of horsepower and in this case it's 14.42 if you divide 212 by 14.7 so it should be making almost 14 and a half pounds or a little bit less a little bit shy of that so the question is why is it not so I'll put that question to you guys what do you guys think why is that m90 supercharger not following the formula where it should be making for near 14 and a half pounds, but yet we're only seeing, you know, closer to 10. And that's, that's off by quite a bit. Cause that's off by four, you know, more than 40%. And that's a pretty big change. I mean, four horsepower is not a lot, but as a percentage, it's pretty high. So you don't want to be off by that much. So why do you guys think that the, that the, that the amount of power it's making per pound of boost it's so far off what it should be of what, of what the, um, you know, what the mass says it should, which is always interesting. I get, I got some of those comments today that I was reading that, oh, the math tells us that it should be doing this. I'm like, I know. And I want that to be true, but math is not the, like, is not the engine. It's not the, it's not what we see in actual results. So I know that you want that to be the case, but a lot of times it's not. That's why we actually test and we just don't do calculations because I can sit here with my calculator and do calculations all day long and look like a hero, but it doesn't always do that. Sometimes the motor doesn't even run and then it makes life a lot more difficult. But, and, and I'm, I want to see, uh, let's see where on the blades M90 makes a lot of heat. Let's see, do the math. Parasitic losses of turning the M90. Yep, all, all of those are right. And that's the reason. The reason is, this, there are several reasons. One is that there's no intercooler. So it's for, for a, any sort of force induction to actually make the kind of power that you're supposed to make, according to the formula, everything has to be right. And that means that the charge temperature has to be right. And we don't have the charge temperature right on this. We have a non-intercooled version, which is bad. We also have uh, this particular form of force induction, a roots blower is low man on the totem pole in terms of efficiency. So in terms of the heat that's generated per pound of boost, a roots blower is actually fairly high. So it's the least efficient of all of the, of the systems that we could choose compared to a twin screw, a centrifugal, or a or a turbo, obviously, is going to be the best one because it has. And, and the other problem is that we have to subtract out the parasitic loss associated with driving the supercharger. It takes power to drive that blower for it to process that amount of air to make power. You know, it's all normal stuff. So we don't have we don't have good charge temperature because we don't have intercooling. We have a fairly inefficient form of supercharging, although in this, it, at, like at eight pounds, the root spore is actually kind of in its sweet spot. So if you were going to run one, which is what the factory is doing, that's where you'd want to be running it at. Seven, eight pounds seems to kind of be the the go to boost level for these for these combinations. And then and then it takes power to drive that. So you lose all of that in the formula. And that's where then that's what we're seeing here is that that's why it's not really making the formula that we see. Um, but it was an interesting round of testing. And this is this is part one. I actually have one, two, three, four other videos that I'm doing on this.
with the you know a tremendous amount of data that's available here and, and a lot of them are even things that you and this is what's cool about having all of this data and and logging every run when you make changes and stuff because when we were for instance when i was doing the water meth testing i ran through a bunch of different nozzle sizes because i wanted to see really kind of you know we would start out doing the extremes so i wanted to start with the smallest nozzle to think that okay well excuse me that's going to give me the least amount of change in the tuning that i have to do so it's going to affect the air fuel ratio the least amount what i was hoping is the smallest amount of water meth injection could give us enough of a change in in charge temperature that we're just missing it in there and that would be beneficial and maybe we have to adjust the tune just a little bit as it turned out that's not the case so a little bit of water meth injection doesn't seem to have a big change in the charge temperature so we stepped all the way up to the other side of the equation and went to a six which is the biggest nozzle that we had and the six made a dramatic change in fact we could just drown the essentially drown the motor with the six if we turned it up immediately and all the way, all the way through the RPM range. And so we could just, the problem is that we could get a really low charge temperature um, according to the our, our gauge, uh, according to our type K thermocouple, basically is what we were using in there, which is a concern because we're, you're wetting that as well. Now it's, it should be much better running it through the blower. Um, but Again, it's a it's a concern. It's is the is the reading accurate that we're getting? Are we wetting that thing? Is not good. The one thing I can tell you is we saw a the thing that I like is that we saw a consistent change in air fuel versus the amount of water methanol that we were supplying. So it was doing exactly what science and the laws of physics tells us that it should be doing when we don't have enough. The, the change in charge temperature is less. And when we have a lot and overabundance, the charge temperature is way low and, and it's doing what it's supposed to. And then that correlates with when we have too much, it's also hurting power and by quite a bit. So all of those things kind of went together. So it tells me that it, at least we have a fairly accurate number. I know that there's lots of concern about the, the uh, speed of a type K and all that, but at least we're getting a number and we're getting a change and we're, and we're seeing a, a drop and we've monitored charge temperatures and things like this an awful lot. And, and what we're seeing is at least fairly consistent. So the, the water meth test was interesting because I was able to run, you know, different levels and um, also not only different levels, but different, um, you know, <laughs> I want to call them advanced curves, but that's not it. You're just starting your 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 initiation point of when the water meth injection starts based on boost. And then you're also creating a maximum when, when the thing is at full flow. So you have a maximum point and an initiation point, and then it creates a you know a slope between those two things. And so if you can get that slope right with the change in the desired change in temperature and then without hurting power and with hopefully maybe helping power if you can do that. Um, I like the tuning ability and it's very, very easy to do with that snow performance deal that we did. So that's another one of the videos that are coming up and that will be, um, that will be cool stuff. The other thing I did is we ran, I put, I took off the, the series two um, blower, the L67 blower with the 3.8 inch pulley and put on a gen five blower. And unfortunately I didn't have a, I didn't have a 3.8 inch pulley to put on that blower. So I have a pulley upgrade as well. And it's okay because I wasn't, I, I, as much as I wanted to do a direct back-to-back -back test, I honestly don't think we're gonna see a dramatic change in the power going from one blower to the other. It, it might be some, but I don't know that it's gonna be a lot because given the change that we saw going from what, what I did was I went from the stock blower the stock early blower with the 3.8 inch pulley to the gen 5 blower with the 3.2 pulley and then we did we also did a, um uh i did the different timing levels at the higher boost level and naturally we had e85 in it already because we were already at higher boost level i mean with the 3.2 pulley and that gen 5 blower and the gen 5 obviously throttle body as well because they're they're a match set and the gen 5 intake manifold again that's a match set 
we were seeing nearly 15 pounds of boost. So that's a lot of boost to be running uh, non-intercooled. <laughs> and we didn't have the water meth engaged in it anymore, which would, which would have been, you know, probably beneficial. But we did run the water meth um, at this boost level, but that was a test after this. So we ran the, I ran the pulley, the 3.2 pulley on the Gen 5 blower at different timing levels, again, to demonstrate to people, and this was on E85, to demonstrate people what happens when we, when there's a change in timing, if you have to take timing away, how much power is it worth? Um, when we can timing and run it kind of spicy, then, you know, how much power is that worth? And so if it's, you know, and the reason I do that is if we go up from, say, 20 degrees to 22 degrees, and we only gain five horsepower, I'd never do that. I mean, I, it's not, it, that's, that, that extra five horsepower is not worth the potential of uh, the potential of us getting closer to detonation because here's the thing that happens with timing is if we go from five degrees of timing to seven or eight degrees of timing and then to 10 or 15 degrees of time we're we're going to see fairly big jumps in power sizable jumps in power because it's not going to make any power with very very low timing and then we see sizable jumps and then as we go up and up and up in timing we'll start getting to the point where we have diminishing returns. So we start where, where we were getting 10 horsepower and then eight horsepower and then six and then five and then two and then one. And then when you start getting there, what you're doing is getting close to where this thing doesn't want any more timing at this, at this power and boost and octane level. And then once you get there going beyond that is you're going into the destruction zone <laughs> into the detonation area. And so the closer you get to the point where you're not getting big gains anymore, the more likely you are to get closer to detonation. So if it's only a couple of horsepower, I would go back in timing and just, I, I want to err on the safe side of that curve rather than on, a, I'm going to get every last little horsepower up. You know, if you've got to make, if, if this is the last, um, in the last race in the finals or whatever, and you got to, you, you know, you need another hundredth or whatever, and you got to turn it up and you got to do what you got to do. And, and that's worthwhile, but not for, not for driving all the time. And not, and for me, uh, I made a promise that un unlike with the L32, that we weren't really going to get after like every last horsepower on this thing. Cause I would rather have this thing, if it was going to be a runner and stay alive, I'd rather have it stay alive and keep testing and even if I didn't get the last two or three or whatever, it's it's not a big deal. I'd rather have the thing be alive because we're going to do something terrible to it later on when we put ring gap in it and and put you know real head studs and, and head gaskets and all that stuff and and a ported head. Um, so the other thing we did, uh, the other did thing I did while I was there is we uh, and you'll be seeing this video coming up as well is I did a cam swap. We put the same comp cam in it. We put a it was a 210, 220 cam. Yeah, and <clears throat> low 500 lift, 114 degree LSA, I think is where we were on that camshaft. Not big, still mild, but already at a point where we're maybe starting to trade power a little bit, especially way down low. Um, I think if we would have tightened up the LSA, it probably wouldn't have done that. It's definitely going to do that more as we go up in power. Um, I had somebody tell me in one of the comments that the this motor is not going to make any power once you go past the 212 cam, which on the exhaust, we're already past that. So we know that that's not accurate. Um, but I love getting the comments from the guys, you know, guys that think that they know everything and, and that have, have tested everything and know everything about that particular engine family because they've been doing it forever and they don't really understand where testing would tells us like what the reality is. Um, but the camshaft, uh, picked up good power, but I wasn't done with that because, you know, we were so close to one of the power numbers that I wanted to get to. So we had another pulley. I changed the blower. Uh, we put a three inch pulley on it, which is really spinning the thing pretty fast. Um, and, and we could kind of tell that by charge temperatures because naturally with that blower pulley, we had the highest charge temperatures of any of the tests data that we generated during that day. So we were spinning the thing pretty fast and it, it, it makes me wonder how high the charge temperature is for some of these guys that have like a two and a half inch pulley on these things that are really spinning them up. Especially if you make more than one run in a row, <laughs> the charge temperature starts to climb. It gets really hot. The one thing that's nice, and I have to say about the water meth, is that the charge temperature seemed to um, stabilize fairly well. 
So it stayed even the starting, even the initiating like temperature, because there's always going to be a rise in temperature, although not with the water method. <laughs> it started out a little bit high and then dipped down and then came up at the end. With no water meth, um, and probably with no intercooler too, what you see is just a rise. It starts out at some fixed point and then rises by 50 or 60 degrees to the end of that. And then if you make multiple runs in a row, what happens is it still rises that same amount. It just starts out higher each time. Now you can cool that off by you know, letting the thing breathe and letting it idle and letting the bypass valve work and recirculating some of that hot air out and, and recirculating some fresh air in. The thing is that idle, you're not really getting um, much air circulation going in there. So you have to do it for a little while. You can turn it off and let it set. And, and you know, there are a couple things to do, but um, with no intercooler in there or no water meth injection, you, and, and with no, <laughs> no charge cooling whatsoever, and you're really turning these things up. Charge temperature should be definitely a concern with these things. And the nice thing about, and the reason that we did the camshaft is the nice thing is it lowers the charge temperature. I mean, lower it does lower the charge temperature and it does that by lowering the boost, which it definitely did. And I'd like to see even more, a, a more dramatic drop in boost by making the motor more efficient, which is what we do when we put a camshaft in it. And, putting a cylinder head in it. So we can talk a little bit about the cylinder head. Um, and that's the head that I ported that I did the hand, the super Richie hand porting on. Um, again, spent hardly any time on it, not knowing what I'm doing. Got some fairly good gains. We went from like 185 to 207 or something like that. Um, and, and with gains, you know, solid gains through the whole lift range, which is good, which means what I did was right and it worked. Um, just going off of what people were telling me and what, you know, you guys are instructing and stuff. Um, that all worked out good. And I, what I'm wondering is if I put a ported head on there that's flowing something like this to 05, 210, 215, whatever the number is, um, you know, some sort of stage one or stage two-ish kind of head, what, um, what will happen to the boost? I'm hoping that the head's going to make it more efficient like the camshaft does. Cam timing has much, seems to have much more effect on that. But if we put a ported head on there and, and do it right, uh, I think we'll see another drop in boost. We'll definitely see it if we go from a 210 cam to a 220 cam, a 220, 230 kind of thing. And I'd like to test, I, I want to put a camshaft in there that's fairly big that we would run on the big bang motor. But I also want to do something in between the cam that I have and the cam that will, <laughs> excuse me, that will eventually put in. So I want to run a, you know, a 220, 230 cam, and then a 230, 240 kind of cam, because that's the one that we will use to make lots of power. And then after I do the blower stuff, um, I'm going to get a small pulley. I would like to kind of do an intercooler because I'm going to run a two and a half inch pulley and spin this thing that fast. It's going to need some sort of charge cooling. It's going to have to have an intercooler or something um, in, in water meth, even just to keep the charge temperature down. I don't think we saw a big changes in power from the water meth, um, but the test that I wanted to do was to compare the different types of water meth. And that's what this test is, and that's what the video is gonna be. It's to be a comparison between the boost juice stuff and then two different kinds of windshield washer fluid, which people use as a cheap substitute for either use buying that boost juice from the guys from snow or a lot of guys apparently and this is what i've been told from the comments is guys mix their own so it seems like a lot of trouble to go through and and why a lot of guys probably don't want to do that but if you get the mixture right it's supposed to be you know beneficial so i you know i, I salute the guys that are doing that uh i honestly still am not convinced and, and i want somebody to help me with that <laughs> i'm not convinced that uh water meth and pump gas, I'm not convinced that it will do what E85 does. And I'm also not convinced that it does what an intercooler does. So, I, you know, if that's the case and people are doing that, I, I want them to show me that that's the case. And, I, and, the, and the reason I brought that up is because the next test that I do is I'm going to do a 91 plus water meth versus E85. Um, both of those I think are good for non-intercooled applications and we won't bring an intercooler into this. And that will be interesting to see if we can run, you know, the 91 with water meth and do the tuning 
and get like run them at the same timing as we run E85. So we run, in this case, we run 22 degrees, let's say, both with E85 and then with 91 plus water meth. The thing that concerns me again, like always with water meth is unless we have direct port water meth injection, we don't know that we're getting even distribution. I think in this situation, injecting it before the blower and having it mix <laughs> and homogenize, I guess, um, into a big open common plenum lower intake manifold. I think the odds are with us that it's going to be better than it was with the long runner stuff when we tested on the LS, but I, I don't know that it's going to be ideal for us because we have a fairly big safety margin on the engine dyno. We're running it cold and, and it's, we have cold air, especially now it's going to be winter and stuff. Um, I don't think it will be a problem for the test, but it'll be interesting to see if, if the water meth can actually make as much power as the E85 does at the same timing level. And then guys can argue about, you know, which one costs more and, uh, and all of that stuff. Uh, where we are, and, and this is probably more for guys that don't have E85. Because if you have E85, it's cheap. It's less expensive than, certainly a lot less expensive than premium is than 91 is in California. So it's a better way to go. But if you can't get 91, then you almost have to do that. And so guys want to see, okay, if I, if I can't get E85 and I have to do this, what am I going to get? What does it do? do? Can I actually get the same thing? And I, I want it to work, <laughs> but I, what I want is the truth. I want whatever accurate data is and, and we can figure out what's going to go on. So those are the tests that are coming up on the 3,800. And then, you know, all of this is prepping us for putting multiple turbos on this thing at a big air to water air cooler and doing it and treating the motor like it should be with a turbo deal. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know if that's for me, Tim, but, but this thing has springs in it already. It has yellow springs in it. And I'm going to, when the heads are ported, we'll put springs on them. I'm probably going to put uh, like the 26918 beehive springs on it too. So let's see what kind of, let's see what kind of questions you guys got for tonight. Make your own E85. That's what guys were saying. Pump with pure meth. So you think that instead of instead of injecting water meth, we should inject just the meth, right? Just methanol. These HP tuners and DHP when I turn tune 3800s. All of those, all of those factory ECUs, if you can tune them, they can give you the right air fuel and the right timing. That's all you need to do. LS6 springs are really cheap. Randall, it definitely does. The water alcohol, the water meth stuff definitely knocks um, chambers, combustion chambers down, or combustion temperatures down, and church temperature. So you have a L67 on ethanol and you're running 24 degrees from 3,800 to 6,000. Uh, you, you do what works. If, you, if that's working for you at the drag strip then and, and it's not blowing up, then, then it works. Um, this one didn't seem to respond very well um, going from 21 to 22 degrees. It didn't really pick up very much power. So we never even went to 24. 
I may have tried 20 as high as 24 on the um on the L32 but it didn't seem to you know it didn't seem to want gain a bunch of power up there Uh, David, I do want to test the inserts. Is that for the um, early composite intake manifold? Uh, what intake, Richard, off topic, but what intake do you recommend for a Magnum 5.9 NA and for a boost keeping it injected? So you're, you are going to run boost. The boost is just going to add power to whatever intake you choose. So you can run the factory kegger manifold, and that will work well. Um, it will give you the power curve that that long runner deal does. Uh, a dual plane, if there was an injected dual plane, I think that that would be my choice. I don't know if you're, if you're this is going to be a race car or a street car or whatever it is. Uh, I don't know about that part of it, but just in terms of power, the a dual plane is kind of a, a really good choice for that 360. The Trek Norris cam needs springs in it. I don't know about nitromethane. Casey wants to know how much time do you have to run with nitromethane? I don't know. Um, I, I've never tried it. Uh, but I didn't test the... Um, I did, Bud wants to know, Richard, do you plan on putting the comp cam in the NA combination to find out how well it works? Although he didn't phrase it quite like that. Um, but I didn't run this thing. I don't think I ran it NA with the cam in it. Uh, I did not. We only ran the cam with the supercharger because I ran out of time. But I could run, I could just put the NA intake manifold on there and run it. Um, my guess is we're going to see similar gains um oh, we, maybe we not might not see quite as much let's see what, what do we get from the camshaft yeah i i expect that we would see less than we did under boosted application if we just ran it na Well, the, Dan, the water is just getting in the way, right? I mean, the, the methanol will cool just fine, and it's a fuel. So if you can use that fuel, the water is not going to burn. Let's see. Water meth will increase boost before the supercharger? I'm not sure what, I, what you mean by that. If we add water meth injection before the supercharger, which is where we inject it, we inject it into the throttle body, you think that the boost will go up? Any tips for a 544 valve swap? 98 Mustang, I got a 54 pulled out of a truck. Um, boost works really, really well on them. The navigator heads work really good. There's lots of camshafts available for them. Uh, Dave wants to know, planning to try the NA3800 block for compression comparison to slow the M90. So you want to run more static compression, like run the NA, the 9 to 1 motor, 9 half to 1 motor, whatever the NA version of that is, and then slow down the M90? Yeah, uh, Jesse said 24 degrees of timing is a bit much. I usually stay below 22. That's kind of where this thing wanted to be. Cars with, this makes sense from Randall. Cars with knock sensors can go quicker with water meth injection due to spark retard. And, the, and, and I think I mentioned that in the video that in the car, things are going to be different. We're in an optimized condition where we've taken, you know, knock retard out of this, out, out of the system basically. And that isn't the case when you're in the car. And so if you can add water meth injection and it adds the timing, cause it's not 
there's no, it's not sensing detonation. It's not sensing knock. So then you get more timing and then it should go faster. You're going faster because of the timing, but the water meth injection is enabling. It's an enabler for timing. Jonathan, I have a nine and a half to one L83. Is the L83 a late model 5.3? You should just run it the way that it is. His question is, do I really need to lower the compression for boost? No, you don't. Would it be better off with higher compression? It will make more power, but then you need higher octane. Picked up two miles an hour from 20 to 24. So did, but uh, 97 Z28, um, it's in a Sunfire and I kept picking up mile an hour with every degree. So he's talking about going from 20 to 24 degrees in the 3800. I picked up two miles an hour going from 20 to 24. I might be at the limit now. Um, I would suggest that you test going from 20 to 22 and see if it still picks up that two miles an hour. Because you might be picking up most of the gain from the first two and very little from the next two if you did a if you did a four degree jump. Normally we do in one degree increments. Sometimes I do it in two. If I'm down at 24, I go to 26 um, because I I one degree is not like on an LS on an NA LS. I know that the one degree is not going to do anything, or that it, I I know that it's going to do stuff past that one degree. So we might may throw a couple in there, but when I get near the top, I, I'll go in one degree increments. Uh, Chad, I can tell you so that you don't have to wait. I mean, the video is going to be coming out soon, but we had the charge temperature was over 200 degrees with the three inch pulley. And that was after we put the camshaft in it that lowered the boost. Um, so if you had a three inch pulley with a stock cam, <laughs> you're going to be running a lot of temperature. Uh, oh, David, are the, oh, so both of them. The inserts, both of those manifolds are two piece, right? So you can take them apart and do inserts in both of them. Yeah, David, I'm I'm definitely interested. So I, I did I respond to your emails? James, Super late now that you've got the blower turbo. We, that's why we did it. I made that so that we could put a turbo on it. And we're, and we're definitely going to do that. So Randall says that the gasoline expands at an 800 to one ratio and the water at a 1700 to one. So he's, you're, you're getting steam propulsion driving the piston. So you're saying that if we just did water, that we would get more power than we would from a water and fuel combination. Slade drew 12. Hey, Richard, I have a 96 Camaro with a 3800. I put an M90 Gen 5 blower on it. Nice. I got a guy, a fab guy to weld a rear wheel drive style throttle body adapter for the blower. Okay, cool. Tim wants to know, what does a good stock LS engine run for timing? Does a stock LS2 usually make peak power at like 28 or 29? That's exactly right. The 29 seems to kind of be the number for most of the LS stuff that I run. Some of the six liter stuff with, uh, or anything with a 317 head might like another degree or two um, because of the chamber design or size. Uh, but they all seem, even LS3s tend to want to be right in the 29, 30 range. That's with the Holly HP. If we run an MSD and it's carbureted, it, it wants more because I think that there's delay built. There's delay in that box. So we've seen that on other carbureted small block Chevys and Fords and stuff. There's delay in the MSD ignition amplifier. So we usually run a degree or two more with that than we do without. Yeah, Jesse, we're, Jesse said, uh, do we need to see the difference in power between the NA intake and the gutted blower intake with the turbo? Well, we can do that test NA and it will show what they do because it's going to do the same thing, NA and boosted. 
I would like to try some tricks on the gutted blower because I want to put, uh, you know, a, a little angle plate in there to direct the airflow down rather than having it come and smash that back wall, that flat back wall. Maybe it doesn't do anything, but it would make me feel better to try it. What size injectors do we have on the L67? Um, I don't remember. I think that they're 80s, but they might be the um, Snake Eater 1500s. Either way, we have enough. Uh, we have a lot of injector in it, or more than enough for the power level that we're at. Will you be modifying the PCV on the Turbo 3800 to avoid pressurizing the crankcase? Um, I was thinking about uh, plugging or capping a lot of those holes, uh, if that's what you're talking about. Uh, VIS44, several engines I've seen that, that use water meth injection seem to clean the tops of pistons. They do. It's like steam cleaning. It works really good. It does that to the spark plugs too. The spark plugs I pulled out like <laughs> were awesome. They were brand new. Yeah, Randall, I, I'm not convinced that the water meth injection makes power. Uh, I don't think that it does. I think it does on a diesel application because if you add more fuel to it, since the thing is throttled by fuel, if you introduce more fuel, even if you're introducing some water with it, I think you add power. But on the gasoline engine, I don't think that that's the case. I ha At least I haven't seen that in my testing. I think it allows you, it, it enables you, it's an enabler, enables you to have more timing or have enough if you're running on pump gas and you're using this to augment the charge temperature to run enough timing to where the thing wants to be run at, then you're not losing power. But that's why, but whenever we run E85, E85 gains power over 91. Even if we're running an optimized timing with 91 and we just put E85 in it, we gain power. And then we gain even more when we add more timing. Uh, Mike, we're gonna. I'm gonna try all of the NA intake manifolds, but a lot of guys run the gutted blower one, and that's very, very popular and prevalent. So we want to test that as well. Uh, Admiral, hey Rich, I want your opinion. Is going to an aluminum block worth the extra five hundred dollars on my four six? It's a bit stronger and about eighty pounds lighter. It's gonna help with everything. It's gonna help with handling. It's gonna help with braking. It's going to help with acceleration. <laughs> it's going to help with everything. So you just have to decide how much the value that has and put the price on it. Um, given what Mahovitz says with the aluminum blocks, I, I would say that that would be the way to go. But if you don't have the 500, then you use the iron one. Uh, James, it doesn't require uh, uh, the NA intakes don't require a head change. You can run you can run the L32 or the L67 heads, and you can run the intake, and you just have to have two sets of injectors or one set of plugs in one of the heads, and you can run that just fine. DJ lamp 14, I plug the injector ports on my L36 Aussie intake, but I run L67 aluminum or L, yeah, L67 aluminum heads. Nice, nice. Aluminum heads, that would be the way to go. JCS performance, you know the 3800 NA motor has more compression. Yes, it has more than the supercharged version. Uh, Dan, any alcohol adds oxygen to the mix. Water doesn't bring anything to the game. It's H2O. The O is right in the water. You just have to find a way to separate it from the H, and then you get all that O.
uh, Admiral breaks. Uh, Admiral said, I have the cash. I'm just bouncing that between that, between the, the aluminum block and a rear brake upgrade. Brakes are very important. The rears are not as important as the fronts, but brakes are also important, especially if you're going to have something that makes a million horsepower. Uh, JCS performance. He needs to test an L26, L36, the NA versions of the 3800 um, bottom end that has more compression. That's planned on. I, I want to do, when this stuff is all done with the supercharged version, I'd like to run an NA version and at least do a top swap on it. And we can kind of compare that uh, to the stuff that we ran before that beforehand. Uh, Google, do you remote tune? I do not. Yeah, Jesse, Jesse Murray, engine masters tested water meth versus pure meth and pure meth wins. That's not surprising. It's fuel. So No, I haven't seen aluminum L67 heads available for a long time, James. <laughs> now, now free it up, right? That's right. Alex wants to know, is there any difference between the L32 heads and the L36 heads besides the injector locations? Well, that that's going to affect or could potentially affect airflow through that port. I, I honestly think you'd see very little change in airflow between those two heads. So I don't think we really make any difference from performance. And especially if we're going to port them anyway, which we want to do. Alex, I was going to top swap, but I wasn't sure whether to do heads too. Thanks for the information. I don't think you need to look at that from a performance standpoint. I think if you're thinking about doing a, um, you're doing a top swap that, and you want to get the heads, that's just to make it easier so that you can just use the heads and the intake manifold, the blower and the fuel rail, all that came with the, from the L67 or the L32 that you're putting on the high compression bottom end. <laughs> So Google, you're going to blow your motor up now. <laughs> uh, Mike, actually, if you need a tune, he, he said, I just need a tune what, <laughs> that works. And I know you have the data. If you want a tune and it's an LS, then you, you need to ask Matt. Oh, it's sloppy. He's got file cabinets full of that stuff with any kind of combination that you have. He's probably already done it and it's ready to go with the factory ECU. I mean, that seems like a no brainer there. <laughs> David, David, you need an electric water pump and pump up those dyno numbers. Those are rookie numbers. I know a guy, I think, um, I wonder if, uh, we have a remote, we have a remote Mazir that I could easily fabricate up a plate to run if we wanted to do that. Um, I like the fact that it has all the stuff on it. It makes makes swapping cams especially kind of a pain, but still it's, you know, it's kind of, of a good way to do it. Uh, Richard, after watching your video, I'm going to try porting my 243 heads for my LS2 six liter build. You can, you can get more power out of them. I haven't seen people be able to do the LS heads to the same level as the guys that are doing professional LS heads. Like, I think I get a lot closer. I think I can get a lot closer on these 3.8 liter heads to what's out there. Not maybe not David Visor level, but, but for what people were selling, I think I can get close to that. And I think that guys that I have here that don't do porting on 3,800 heads, but do porting could get really close to that. Um, but I don't think I could get like, like, I don't think I, I couldn't go take a set of 706 heads and do what Brian Tooley did or what total engine airflow does. I don't think I could get anywhere near that. But if your dad is a TV repairman and he has an ultimate set of tools, you can fix it.
Yeah, Google, um, Matt at Sloppy Mechanics has all of those tunes. He has a setup where you can take this turbo and this injector and this intercooler and this camshaft and here's the tune and voila, you're making a bajillion horsepower from a factory with a factory ECU. They tell you how to do the wiring harness, everything. He's, he's really good at that. Use the dyno water. To, you can use the dyno water to heat up your pool in the winter. It, we do get it pretty hot sometimes. Any words on the Phytech standalone system? I've never run it, so I can't really tell you about it. The only thing I've ever tested from the Phytech stuff is the intake manifold that they had way back, which was an exact, the same one fabricated sheet metal deal that that is a sniper or any of these other companies that sold them. And it does what they always do. It's short runner. It loses power down low. Uh, Google, go go do a search for sloppy mechanics and you'll find all the information you need. Okay, guys, two more minutes. Because we know I got to get back to work doing more 3800 stuff. The next one will be the blower upgrade, which, you know, if somebody's going to have a supercharged motor, what they're going to do is put a pulley on it. And if you have an L67, you know, you'd put the Gen 5 blower on it and a pulley. Yeah, Dan Dan said on the old Superflow 901s, the impeller would cavitate and sell Superflow send out an updated pump. It's literally boiling the water and pitting the impeller. We saw that on the old 901s. Uh, also, they don't like the that dyno setup doesn't like hot water. If you get the water temperature up near 100 degrees, uh, it's not going to work very well. Uh, Richard, if you could reattempt the Bonneville Sark salt car, what would your ideal 3800 setup be now? Um, if, if I could do it for the first time, cause I wouldn't reattempt it cause I never attempted it. Um, I told them I didn't want to do it, but if I could, if I was not saddled with the M90 blower, any other blower I put on there would work. You could do that. If I had to be a blower, then I would use a twin screw. Um, you could also do it with a Vortec or a pro charger. The ideal thing would be to do it with a turbo because then you could have, a really good power curve and make all the power that you want. You could certainly like the, the necessary power to go in that car was very aerodynamic. They did a nice job on the body and all of that stuff. So to get that car to go 200 miles an hour, didn't take a lot of power. It'd be really easy to make that kind of power with a turbo. When are you going to have a 289 Ford for testing? I've had, I have 289 Ford videos up. We not only did we do a 289, we did a hypo 289 and a Shelby 289. And I've also done a, I think a lower version of a 289 as well. <laughs> Tom wants me to 2.5 pull it. That's going to be a lot of temperature. That's that's got to be 300 degrees. I'm I'm thinking. Uh, I am not still at West Tech right now. So James, you're building another LY6? Richard, we were building another LY6 for the Turbo Trailblazer SS. The last one broke two pistons in the Ringland area. This time we'll manage the heat better. Did you have enough ring gap in it? Mike, you guys should check out CDP for the 3800 build and parts. Um, I got the pulleys from them. Uh, at least the three inch pulley in the hub we got from them.
Daniel, um, thanks for devoting so much time for the 3800 engines. It matters to us owners and nobody does it better. Thank you very much. I, I like all the motors and I like people to have as much information as they can. That's real verified dyno stuff. That 2.5 pulley is a drill, a belt driven space heater. That's pretty good. I really like that. Uh, what Alex wants to know what causes the M90 to get so hot just out of curiosity. They're inefficient. They're they're really good. A roots blower is really good at moving air. So what it does is grab air from one side of the blower. In this case, sometimes it's from the top. Sometimes it's from the back. They're grabbing air and just moving it from one side to the other. And when it does, um, the air on the other side, it's beating the air up. Because the roots blower is not terribly efficient by design. A twin screw is much more efficient. It has internal compression, which a lot of the roots guys say, oh, it heats up that air. No, it has internal compression. It's much more efficient by design. So you can make a lot more power with the same displacement uh, twin screw than you can with the roots blower. The roots is not very good at, at heating the air. I mean, it's very good at heating the air up and it works very well in the lower boost ranges. It's when guys try to spin them up really fast it really gets hot and, and inefficient. It gets bad. It gets bad at both things. It gets bad both at moving the air from one side of the blower to the other, which it was designed to do. You get bleed back of the air back past the rotors. Um, it buffets the air. It does all kinds of bad things. Tim wants to know, is there any stupid stuff in the way of the crank pulley on the dyno? Yes, there is. There, uh, there are things around the, the, there's a mount, there's a big mount in the car. Um, and I'll have to look and see if we, we got rid of that mount. I know we uh, unbolted that, but I still think that the blower or the crank pulley is close to something else. I got another pulley from the guys at ATI and we're going to run that. But you going over in the blower pulley or in the crank pulley size is a good idea. The only thing is that when you do that, um, and, and if you did it on both of them, both the one that drives the supercharger and the one that drives the accessories, um, you'd be spinning the other things faster and you'd lose a little bit of power from overspeeding the water pump and the alternator and the power steering and stuff. But you would get more boost from it, and, and you don't have to worry so much about belt slippage, which I think is going to become an issue once we go past the three-inch pulley. A 2.3-inch pulley. Oh, just weld some quarters together. The twin screws have bypass valves as well. Does anyone make a twin screw that will fit the L67 engine? Daniel, you got the last question of the night because I have to get going. And Daniel's question is, but does anyone make a twin screw that will fit the L67? I did. I made an adapter to bolt a Kenny Bell twin screw onto the 3800. And that video is up. You can see, I, like I did that way back. I think I did that back in uh, 2000, 2001, probably something like that. Uh, that's back when we were. I was doing rammer technology stuff. And it, it was a fairly simple adapter to make, to put the blower on. And I think I might do that again if, the, if I get enough interest in that. Because that the twin screw immediately made, like right away, I think we made 50 or 60 more horsepower than the M90 was doing. So it was pretty easy to do. And that motor didn't have anything. It didn't have a camshaft. It didn't have ported heads. It didn't have anything really going for it. It was just kind of a stock one. But we could make a, a lot more power with the Kenny Bell. The thing is, even with the Kenny Bell, we could run a more boost obviously and it has more flow rate so it could make more power but the thing that it also is doing is raising the boost a lot and <laughs> a lot of boost without an intercooler is you know maybe not the best idea so we have to introduce water meth injection or some kind of intercooler to run and sandwich that which would kind of be cool that that's why i want i'm kicking around the idea of taking the 2.8 liter kenny bill that i have with a giant size 2500 CFM throttle body that feeds that thing. But the thing that I like about it is that it has an air to water intercooler integrated, like mounted on the bottom of it. And I just need to make a big enough and thick enough adapter to go put that floor assembly on top of a 3800, which would be awesome. Thank you guys all for showing up. Um, you know, it's awesome to be back. 
So we'll start doing these things more nightly. I'll have another video go up tomorrow on the, this one will be on the blower upgrade. So guess what happens when we put a bigger or a better blower and a smaller pulley on there? That's right, more boost, which is always good. Thank you guys for showing up. I will see you all tomorrow. Fourteen seventy 